Okay, now on to the first technique of solving equality constraints. And this is equa uh, constraint elimination. So we want to get rid of the equality constraints. We want to construct an unconstrained optimization problem and totally ignore or write everything down in a form where we can totally ignore the equality constraints. So um, what I had just drawn was that the solution has to lie in the intersection of these half spaces um, or the intersection of these hyperplanes and, um, um, and this for us is the, the motivation to consider explicitly only the solutions that lie in this intersection. So let's look at the example here on the, on the right hand side. Um, and uh, we are in three space and we have uh, as constraint we have two hyperplanes and the solution has to lie on both of these hyperplanes. And therefore effectively my solution can only lie on this intersection here. And the big question is why do I have to consider um, all points in uh, 3D space if I know that the solution has to lie here on the intersection? And why can't I only explicitly look at the points in the intersection? And this is what we're doing with, with constraint elimination. So um, if I then take my matrix A with the constraints and I'm looking at the rank of this matrix, um, I will find out that the, man, that the rank of this matrix will be in many cases less than n and um, therefore I have uh, still uh, many possible solutions that I have to consider but I effectively have only n minus k degrees of freedom and now we want to reduce the optimization problem to something that has um, dimensionality n minus k. Uh, so k is the rank of, of the constraints and uh, we want to take out these dimensions completely and only look at the remaining degrees of freedom n minus k. And how can we do that? So let's suppose that we have one initial solution that is feasible for the equality constraints. So we have a feasible solution a times x0 equals to b. Uh, and uh, so this solution it works for our equality constraints. And then there exists some matrix and in a minute we will see how we can construct this matrix. Um, then there exists a matrix F um, so that uh, we can um, recover all the solutions that fulfill this equation or, or this equation up here. So um, um, what we want to have is there is a solution space. We have the solution space of all the variables x for which ax equals to b. And uh, we want to recover the solution space and it works as follows. We have our initial variable x0 and this initial variable x0 it, it is lying somewhere here on the intersection of the um, equality constraints but it, lie, it could lie anywhere here on this intersection. So I, I need it to be somewhere on the intersection, but um, I, I don't care where exactly it is. And then we have our, uh, then we select some, some z, and z has the reduced dimensionality n minus k, and we are multiplying f with this z and then adding it to x0. So what we, what we effectively do is we have our x0 and then we have here these points f times z and f times z uh, all also lies on this intersection. So f, f times z here uh, constructs all points that go in a direction that do not leave the intersection of the hyperplanes uh, from our constraints. Okay, and um, assume that we have such, a, such an f, then we can rewrite the optimization problem in an unconstrained form. So originally we were optimizing over the x and we had some dimension n, and now we're optimizing over the z 
and have a dimension n minus k. And uh, here we optimize over f of f times z plus x0. And here the points, here the points fz plus x0, I know that these are all lying on the intersection of the hyperplanes defined by our equality constraints ax equals b. And now we are exactly here in a, in a reduced dimensional space uh, that contains only the open degrees of freedom that were uh, left by the equality constraints. Yeah? And when we then have found our z0 or z, z star, then we can recover the solution to the original problem uh, by taking f of z star plus x0. Okay. And now let's see how we can construct this matrix F, how, how the magic happens. So for this matrix F, we want the follow it to have the following property. So we want to be um, Fz plus x0. So this is our mapping back into our original space um, Rn. And uh, we want all the points that have once they have been mapped into the original space times a equals to b and now algebraically we can just uh, transform this a little bit and then say a times f z plus a x zero equals to b and uh, the last part here we know that a times x zero equals to b because this was the, the point that we have selected specifically for that Therefore, we can cancel out here these two sides, and what remains is a times f times z equals to zero. And, um, well, this means that our f is mapping into the null space of a. Meaning, whatever z I'm taking, I choose z randomly, and uh, or I take any z, and uh, by multiplying f with z, I get an element from the null space of A. And now let's recall the definition of the null space of A. So the null space of A were exactly the column vectors D. Yeah? So here I have um, it, D1 and uh, I have D2, and these are all um, and these are all um, vectors. Uh, with the property that if I take a times d1, I get back 0, or the 0 vector. And uh, from the rank nullity theorem, I know that I have n minus k of these um, vectors that are linearly independent and all have the property that if I multiply a with them, I get 0 back. And now we can construct our matrix F um, by exactly taking or combining all these column vectors into one big matrix. And therefore, if I take whatever z I want, if I, um, if I, um, if I multiply f with this z, that exactly means that I have uh, a, a weighted combination of all of my column vectors. And because each of these column vectors multiplied by a gives me zero, uh, the same holds also for the weighted or for the linear combinations of, of these vectors. Okay, and this is the way I can construct my matrix F that helps me uh, defining my optimization problem in a lower dimensional way. Okay. And now let's solve the Kantorovich problem with that. So for the optimal transport problem, uh, we have here uh, our linear objective function and our um, equality constraint ax equals to b and uh, we saw earlier how the a can be constructed and uh, a third we still have here our inequality constraint x greater than zero and um, now let's find out a first feasible solution and finding the first feasible solution in julia would be rather easy because for the first step here i can just say a backslash b and um, that would be the x I'm looking for, some initial x that is a solution to ax equals b. Okay, 
The second step is find the basis of the null space. And again, I have numerical methods doing that for me. And um, uh, then I construct my matrix big F. And uh, last of all, I can now state this as a unconstrained optimization problem, or rather I have removed the equality constraint. The inequality constraints are still remaining. Now I have the unconstrained optimization problem. Here I have xi transposed fz plus x0. I want to minimize that. And now my, my, my inequality constraint, this guy over here, it has transformed a little bit, meaning if I take my solution in the reduced dimensional space and I'm transforming it back into the original space, I want it to be greater than zero. So my fz here has a smaller dimensionality, but when I get back into nine dimensional space where, where the solutions are for moving the soldiers, then I want uh, all elements of the solution to be larger or equal to zero. Okay, so here we have to do some additional work. We have to translate also the, the, equal, the inequality constraint. How do we actually solve that? Uh, so the lines of code will be maybe, maybe 10 or 12 um, actual lines of code or, or semicolon, um, but uh, let's look what they are actually. So first of all, I'm loading the linear algebra package. So in Julia, uh, some, of the, some of the definitions we will be using, they lie, they come from the li linear algebra package. And now let me switch color. Um, second, I have the movement costs from this matrix C. So earlier we had seen a matrix C uh, for all the movement costs and now I'm making a vector out of that. And here this command vec, it transforms the matrix by stacking the column vectors. So here I have the first column vector, the second column vector, the third column vector, and it is just making a big vector C um, see. Um, and here I first take the first column vector, then the second column vector, and then the third column vector of that. Okay, and um, second, I state the equality constraints. So here the movement constraints are exactly what you saw earlier. I have my matrix A, I have my vector B, and I want all solutions to obey AX equals B. And I'm computing the first admission, admissible solution to the equality constraint. And um, uh, actually by computing that, this will be a feasible solution. So by chance, this is also a solution where all the elements are larger than zero. So in principle, it could work. Um, however, it's not an optimal, it's not a cost-effective solution. Okay, now I construct finally my matrix F by taking the null space of A. And this then allows me to uh, state the lower dimensional optimization problem. And uh, these are just helper variables. These are just helper variables with the size of the matrix F. So here the first uh, the size F1, this is the size in the, uh, this is the number of rows. And uh, size F2, so in the direction 2, this is the number of columns. So the first one is the dimensionality of my original optimization problem. So here I have nine rows. And uh, nz here is the number of remaining dimensions. So here I have four, four columns in the, in, for the null space basis, uh, meaning that the reduced dimension of the optimization problem is four. So I have a remaining free degrees of freedom of four. And now I try to find an optimum in the four dimensional space that remains. Okay, how do we do that? First, we load the definitions from the interior point method. So we saw that in the last lecture. Now we just load the, the interior point method function and we're not redefining that here. Um, what we have to define are our new objective functions for the reduced optimization problem. And here what remains, the objective function is just uh, xi transposed times uh, f times z element wise plus x0. Right? So it's, it's a direct translation of the mathematics. And um, so the, the, 
the gradient of that would then be Xe transpose times F and the entire thing transposed and the, the Hessian would be all zeros because it's a, it's a linear function and it, the, the second derivative exists but it is zero everywhere. Okay, now we have to also translate the inequality constraints. So on the previous slide or two slides before we saw that uh, we have to transform the inequality constraints so that I can um, so that the results will hold the inequality constraint in the original space before before transforming to the lower dimensional reduce problem. And um, in this line here, you see two notational tricks. So some syntactic sugar that Julia provides for us that I, I will explain a little bit. So first of all, we have a list comprehension. So this also exists in Python, for example. Uh, so here we construct a a list or a, a vector. So here we construct a list and um, in the list is constructed by going for the variable i from 1 to an x. So here uh, I, I implicitly have a loop. So for i going from 1 to an x and for every entry of this loop I generate one entry in the, room, in the, in the, in the list that I'm generating. And, and now I can use the variable i here for the elements that I'm constructing for my list. And um, so uh, the, the second syntactic trick, I will now switch color, uh, is here this little arrow notation here. And this little arrow notation here, it indicates an anonymous function. So in Julia we have, we can uh, say opt of z equals something to define a function. Uh, we can also, we could also have as an equivalent syntax say function opt of x and then have some definitions and then end with, with end. So this would also work. And the third way to define a function in Julia is an anonymous function. And this is here with the arrow notation. So z goes to and then the the the, the result that z is mapped into. Uh, so what we're doing here is um, we construct a, a list and uh, the list contains all the individual um, positivity constraints um, and uh, here I have to map from the reduced dimensionality to the original space and then I want the result to be uh, smaller than, so here I have the negative sign uh, because in the algorithm for the interior point method I want the results to be smaller than zero and in the optimization problem as we have defined here I want the result to be larger than zero so I'm transforming this and I'm saying here minus x smaller than zero and that then I can solve with the classical methods and the, the, the logarithmic barrier. Okay and um, then I have to do a bit more work uh, also then for the gradient and for the Hessian and uh, both of them I define as a list and the list then contains the gradient and the Hessian of the individual uh, positivity constraints that I have for all the elements of my, of my uh, solution vector. Okay, so that was uh, quite a mouthful. Now we have defined our objective function in the reduced dimensional space. We have defined our remaining inequality constraints. And now I can just solve that. Now I can just uh, start with some initial point z0. And here we are lucky because we already have uh, the, the solution uh, x0. So this guy here, um, this is already all positive. So it fulfills our inequality constraints. Otherwise, we would have to look for some admissible initial solution. But because that already works, I, um, I can start from, from z0 being all zeros. I drop that into my interior point method that uh, internally uses the Newton method for, for solving and uh, that constructs the, the, the logarithmic barrier to cover all my inequality constraints. So then I get out um, z star, um, so the, the optimum solution in the original, in the reduced dimensional space. From that I can construct the solution in the original space and this I can just plot it and also reshape it into a matrix so that uh, I can compare it 
to uh, the original form with the soldiers from the barracks to the positions and so on. And uh, so here this is the optimum result uh, and uh, the, the cost, the overall transport cost of that would be 540. Okay, so here you saw a very general way of transforming affine equality constraints into something that can be solved by the interior point method algorithms that we have seen, seen last time. And this is always the goal. The goal is always to transform back into the optimization problems uh, we can already solve with our existing algorithms. And that's the great thing about the, um, the constraint elimination technique. We have to do some more work up front when we state our problem, but then we can solve it with existing methods. And uh, we also have a problem of reduced dimensionality. And this is also helpful uh, because we can, it, it scales better. So we, we need less iterations of our algorithms usually to, to solve that. Okay, so in the Julia code we saw on the previous slide, there was a little bit of magic involved when defining the, the gradient and the Hessian. And you might wonder how on earth would, would one find um, this, uh, this correspondence? And also um, for the objective function, um, how, how to find the, the gradient when there is some matrix multiplication involved and stuff like that. So if you, if you train a little bit, the mathematics um, will not be very hard because there's a lot of repetition and uh, there's a lot of structure that can, one can learn by doing a lot of example problems. Uh, but in computer science, uh, when the computer can help us, uh, it's not forbidden to, to, uh, to use that. And there are a couple of resources that can, you can use. So if you have a complicated matrix calculus function and you want to find a derivative for that, um, there is uh, matrixcalculus.org. Hopefully that will exist also in uh, years to come. But uh, right now this is a very helpful resource. You can just plug in your equation then you can then you define uh, what the different elements are, uh, if they are matrices or vectors and so on, uh, or if it's even a symmetric matrix, and uh, you get back out a result. And oftentimes in this lecture, uh, matrix calculus will help you if um, if we want you to to find the derivative of of some function that that has matrices involved. Um, if it gets a little bit more complicated than that, or if you want to um, be independent of having always uh, internet access, uh, you can have a look at the Matrix Cookbook. The Matrix Cookbook is a PDF that's freely available in many places on the internet. And um, this is a very helpful resource and many um, PhD students in, in computer science have this on their, on their shelf. And um, it, it is mathematically more advanced than this course. Um, but um, uh, here you, you find the, the major theorems and the, the major um, yeah, ways to, to compute derivatives in, uh, in, in matrix calculus. Okay, 